together. I was tired. I kept reminding myself what I preached on this morning, just kind of persevere through it, and the Lord give me the energy to, to do this. But I'd like for you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles with us to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 12. Proverbs is a difficult book to have a long text in because it's, it's collections of little short barbed sayings. And even like chapter 15 is a collection of these sayings. And so our text is going to be just one verse this evening. We have many other scriptures that we want to go to, even others in Proverbs. Uh, but this is, will be our text. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Now our text has identified one who, uh, I believe, in the scripture is an enemy of the truth. Uh, therefore, one we should be mindful of and alert in order to recognize. A scorner. I loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Uh, so, of course, our key verse is verse 12. The title is The Ways of a Scorner. It's hard to kind of put together an outline, uh, but... Uh, the, like the many of my older sermons, I just kind of meander through the thoughts here, but uh, we'll have kind of an introduction. One loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. And we see here a sense of superiority and our conclusions. That's kind of the best outline I could come up with for this. Okay, and these will be the scriptures that we want to use. Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they are such as serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And so we need to be mindful of and be able to identify uh, that which is described for us here. Now, the book of Proverbs as a whole is a book of contrast. Uh, the way that these words of wisdom are set forth is in a uh, contrasting wise and foolish. And even in, in just Proverbs 15, we see several examples of that. Uh, verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So just a little statement, but we see how it contrasts uh, so that we can uh, grasp the, the principle here, the ideas. Uh, verse uh, 7 uh, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. And verse 14, he says, The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. And so this is an example uh, from our text uh, chapter here. And this is true all through the book of Proverbs how that it sets forth many of these things in contrasting uh, the wise and the foolish. And I believe, too, we see that there is a spectrum of foolishness uh, described in the Scriptures. 
I mean, we can all uh, behave foolishly. Matter of fact, uh, the scriptures in Proverbs says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. I mean, as we come into this world, uh, our heart is foolish. And there's uh, foolishness bound up in our hearts. But the rod of reproof or correction will drive it far from him. Uh, and so foolishness is something that is common to all of us. And so we learn wisdom is not something that we're necessarily born with, but we have to acquire. And that's the, the purpose of the book of Proverbs is to teach us that we might learn to be wise and to cease being foolish. And as I said, I believe there's a spectrum of uh, foolishness uh, in the scriptures and in the book of Proverbs uh, from the simple. You know, Proverbs 1.22, he said, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And so I believe we see there the, the range from the simple to the scorners uh, identified here in uh, Proverbs 1 and in our text. He's talking about the scorner. Um, a scorner is primarily an Old Testament term. Uh, there are several variations of that word. Scorn, scorner, scorneth, scornful, and it's used 43 times. And of that, only three are in the New Testament. The rest of those is all in the Old Testament. Uh, now, it does use, as we'll see, uh, the word scoffer, which is another term that means pretty much the same thing. In the book of and out of that 43, 17 times, it's used in the book of Proverbs. And the word scorner by itself is used 11 times. And of that 11 times that the word scorner is used, 10 of them is in Proverbs and one is in Isaiah. So, and just a little bit of... Uh, statistical information on that word. Now, as we mentioned, uh, the word uh, in the New Testament uses scoffer, and it's pretty much uh, the same thing because the word, the Hebrew word here, it lutes, is to make the mouth at or to scoff at, and that's the definition, to scoff at or to make the mouth at. And, you know, somebody does, yeah, see, now he's, he's making a mouth at, you know. <laughs> Uh, it describes the physical reaction or some kind of a visible uh, manifestation of the attitude that is within the person. You know, uh, strong feelings that tend to manifest themselves in our facial expressions and other outward uh, uh, means, physical means. And so... That's what this word means, to, to make the mouth at, or to scoff at. And so, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 3 and 4, talks about in the last days, scoffers will come. And uh, so it uses the word scoffer there rather than scorner. But it does mean... Uh, pretty much the, the same thing, 2 Peter chapter 3 um, and verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Um, as I said, this term identifies a type of person, a type of behavior, a type of attitude. Um, 
and the uh, object of the scorn is God and God's people the truth this is the object of the scorn here you know uh, people can be scornful and even uh, people that are saved may have their moments where they're scornful of something but the scorner described here is one who is scornful at God, who is scornful at the Word of God, and scornful at those who believe God and want to follow and serve the Lord. Uh, so this is a very particular application, if you will, of the term. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, now uh, we see... the same type of person identified in the New Testament. He may not refer to them as a scorner, but as uh, we look at through the book of Proverbs and the scorner that is identified there, we find its equivalence in the New Testament described under various other uh, labels. And in Matthew, as I said, uh, this, is, this one is an enemy of the truth. And so in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, he, the Lord admonishes us to beware of false prophets. False prophets. Now, ordinarily, a person may not necessarily connect the idea of the description of the scoffer or the scorner with that of a false prophet, but I believe there is an underlying connection uh, in the, the attitude here because the, the scorner is one who is more militant and active in their uh, opposition, if you will, to the scripture and to the word of God. And so he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. He goes on to say, Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? No. Those fruits, you know, grapes grow on a grapevine. They don't grow on a thorn bush. I don't know that a thorn bush has fruit. Uh, if it does, it, it's, it's certainly not grapes. Do men uh, gather figs of thistles? No. So the plant and the fruit, he's saying it's going to be the same. Whatever that plant is, that is the kind of fruit it's going to bear. You go back to the Genesis and the creation. And as he created all those things to bring forth fruit after their own kind. And so we see that uh, carrying out in a, the spiritual sense as well. And while he's describing the, the, uh, the plants here, and that principle that these plants bring forth fruit after their own kind, he's apply, using that to illustrate the fact that people, uh, an individual, they are the source, they are the, in, in this uh, comparison, they are the plant. And you can identify that plant by the fruit that it produces. And so, he says, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree, now that's the false prophet, that is the false teacher, that is the false brother, because he identifies, he says, a, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, they in reality are a wolf, but they come trying to disguise themselves as a sheep. That's deceitful. But their true nature will be manifested by their fruit. A corrupt uh, tree bringeth forth corrupt fruit. 
A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And who is he referring to? The false prophets he told us to beware of. Uh, and so, uh, this points out a very important fact about these scorners, scoffers, the false prophets. They are deceivers. This is their nature. This is one of the fruits by which you will know them. They are deceivers. Because they, the very, how he describes them here, uh, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They come as lambs, they come as sheep, but in reality they are predators looking for a prey. Uh, they are stalking their prey. Acts chapter 20. Verse 29 and 30, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now these grievous wolves, enter, how are they going to enter in? They're going to enter in pretending to be sheep. That's what Jesus has already said. These false prophets will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And so... Uh, Paul here just says that they grievous wolves entering in among you, not sparing the flock. But they're going to come in, they're going to enter in, pretending, pretending to be uh, sheep. They're deceitful. And he said, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And so, in our, our text... He's describing the scorners say, they loveth not one that reproveth him. A scorner does not like to be reproved. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, now in chapter 8, he talks about all scriptures given by the inspiration of God. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine and so he said you reprove rebuke that's, that's part of the task here and, and the way that the word of God uh, it works when we sin, it reproves us, it rebukes us, and that's needful. And the child of God will acknowledge to God and come to God and fall down before Him and confess His sin to God. And God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, and many times, you know, this, this occurs, but the scorner, he doesn't like to be reproved. None of us like to be corrected. That, that's natural. That's part of that foolishness that's in us when we're born. A child does not like to be corrected. As the child matures, Lord willing, if they do, they will come to accept correction and, and to understand it's, it's helpful, it's beneficial. Uh, it, it prevents them from hurting themselves. It prevents them from doing things that are wrong. It prevents them from uh, making uh, mistakes and errors and so on in life. And so we learn and, and we, we learn to take that correction. We learn to take that reproof and that rebuke. It, it's never pleasant, but we learn to accept it because we understand and appreciate 
It's for our benefit. But some people just never seem to learn that lesson. And they, they do not like being reproved or rebuked. And it goes on to say that, you know, uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but they'll heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. Not that the teachers have the itching ears. They have itching ears. And so they, they gather, they're, they're attracted to and get around them teachers that will teach things that are pleasant for them. Uh, they, instead of rebuking their sin and rebuking their error, they, they don't preach on those things. And so, uh, and we see the effects of that over generations in our own time when we have churches um, that many of those who profess to be Christians are living ungodly lives and their sins are not rebuked. And so they've grown up thinking this is acceptable behavior, this is acceptable because they gathered together teachers having itching ears. And so they're turned from the truth and they're turned to fables uh, instead. But notice 1 Timothy 4.2. 1 uh, let's, let's, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So some of those who have made professions of faith that were following the Lord uh, will depart from that teaching and instead, he said, they give heed, that is, they, they hear the teaching of begin to follow the teaching of seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. I believe we see here the uh, description of those scorners and those false teachers that Jesus warned us of, that Paul warns us of, speaking lies in hypocrisy. When you go back to the wolf that comes pretending to be a sheep, what's he doing? He's speaking lies in hypocrisy. He is being deceitful. He is deceiving uh, believers into thinking that he or she is a believer. Um, and, you know, saying the right things, so they learn the right things to say, and I'll that's the reason he says it's their fruit. It's their fruit that's going to identify, not their words. We get all hung up on words. And, and we have a litany list of, of doctrines and terms and, and words that we, we listen for. And, and I'm as guilty of that, I guess, as anybody because... In our circle, if you will, of what we would say our kinds of churches, there are certain phrases that we grew up hearing and repeating that, and there is not necessarily something wrong with that because Paul talks about that form of sound words that becometh sound doctrine. There are certain phrases and all that are the expressions of that truth and, and the sound, uh, healthy doctrine and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember at one time, because we have certain predispositions and, and ideas, and... Um, there are certain things we don't expect to hear in certain uh, situations. And when I was filling vending machines at uh, the Consolidated Freight Waste Terminal in Mira Loma, California, that was a rough place. I mean, 
I went in there and, and I'd heard nothing but horror stories about that place. They were mean people. <laughs> and I went in there and, and I saw uh, was there, uh, some Bibles tucked away in these where people would put their lunches. And I was thinking, they must be some kind of hardcore Christian or something, you know, they bring their <laughs> Bibles to this place. And, uh, but I got to talk to one of the guys. They had a Bible study there. And um, I was invited to sit in, and so I did. And I had a certain preconceived idea of what I would hear. We formed these ideas. And because I know outside of our kind of churches, the universal church, the non-denominational, interdenominational, the, the, the very weak, wishy-washy kind of teaching that they have. And that was kind of what I was expecting to hear. And there was this one dear brother, he was leading the Bible study, and he was going through the book of John, And when he was reading there in John the fourth chapter where he, uh, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that the true worshipers of God are to worship in, in spirit and in truth. And he came back to that word truth. He said when the Bible's talking about truth, it's talking about sound doctrine. Whoa, I was not expecting to hear that phrase. That's our phrase. We kind of got this copyright on it, you know. And, and coming from this guy, in, in this uh, circumstance here, was not what I was expecting to hear. And, and there, was some, there was some sound brothers there in that group that was trying to be a witness to the truth and was combating a lot of heresy and error. And, uh, and different things that was going on. And we, we wound up getting pretty close and, and having some good fellowship. But it's as, as just one of those things. We have phrases, we have words that we think that, that this is exclusive to us. And let me tell you, a wolf is going to know what those words and phrases are. And they will use them. Um... And so that's the reason I say it's not the words, it's the fruit. I mean, the words are important. There is a place for that. But uh, what we need to look for and to examine is the fruit. In um, uh, 2 Timothy, so oh, anyway, they speaking lies in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I've wondered about that. Scott and I have discussed, you know, and, and talked about this. But it's the idea, our conscience is that part of us, that remnant, if you will, of being created in the image and likeness of God. It is a witness within us as to right and wrong. And even a lost person, when they do something that is contrary to their conscience, will feel remorse, will feel guilt. You know, most of the emotional, psychological problems that people have and the reason they go to psychiatrists and different things is because of guilt. Of course, their, the worldly approach is to deny the sin, therefore there's no guilt. You don't need to feel guilty for it because there's no sin. Whereas the biblical approach is acknowledge your sin, repent of it, and God will forgive you of your sin. But there is this sense of guilt. And so even lost people feel guilty. But the person here, the scorner, there is a particular, and that's the reason I say there's this uh, spectrum of foolishness 
from the simple to the scorner. This, uh, the Bible talks about the person of a reprobate mind. And here's one whose conscience has been seared, if you will. They have no conscience. They have no remorse. They feel no guilt. That's the reason they're such good and effective liars and deceivers, because they feel no guilt. They have no remorse. And so speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, that all goes together. This is a scorner. This is the wolf. Um, and 2 Timothy 3 then, Verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these. And he's talking about the, uh, the description here in the first verses of chapter 3. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections. I think that gets back into this idea of the seared conscience. Truce breaker, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, there's that outward form. They'll come to church. They say the right things. They'll, tie, they'll do what is expected of them in, in, those, uh, in that environment. But inwardly, to denying the power thereof from such turn away. And so these is what he's uh, referring to. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. This is how he describes them here. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're deceivers. They are deceived themselves and they are deceivers. And so, they loveth not one that reproveth them, uh, they will not like it when they get caught out in a deception. And that, see, that's the fruit. When you catch them in a lie, when you catch them deceiving and being deceitful, that's corrupt fruit. When they do it consistently, habitually, And there's no remorse. That's fruit. That is corrupt fruit. And they'll not like it when they get caught out or corrected. And he said, neither will he go unto the wise. <laughs> you know, they will not seek out the company of those who will correctly identify them. Uh, what is that old saying, birds of a feather flock together? They will seek out and encourage other wolves. They will network with other wolves as much as possible. Uh, notice John chapter 3 Verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now this is true of man in general. The lost in general. Uh, fallen man does not like to come to the light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Um, 
For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So they're not going to put themselves somewhere where they're going to be reproved. <coughs> and that's one of the things in Proverbs that talks about the difference between the wise and the foolish. The wise accept correction. The wise man, if he does something wrong and you correct him, see that, that the wise man doesn't necessarily is not someone that does, never does anything wrong. The wise man is one that when he does and he's corrected, accepts the correction and changes his way. And he says, and he'll love you for it. He'll thank you for it. Again, we're talking about fruit. Um... But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, like I said, that his deeds may be made manifest that they were wrought in God. And so, walking in the light, John describes over in 1 John, involves confess, acknowledging our sin, confessing our sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They prefer to work where they can be in control of the situation themselves. Uh, such a person is described in 3 John, the Diotrephes. He loveth to have the preeminence. Verse 9, 3 John, verse 9 says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes who loveth to have the preem preeminence among them, receiveth us not. John would be considered wise. He was an apostle. He was a child of God. And this person in the church would not receive John. Neither will they go unto the wise. And they don't want the wise necessarily coming to them. They try to uh, restrict that and control that as much as possible. And if he wants to have the preeminence, it's a, it's a matter of control. These people want to control. And so they lie, they deceive in order to manipulate, in order to control others. Uh, we preach about it, fog, fear, obligation, guilt. Uh, public shaming are the tools of a cult and the way a cult operates because these types of people and, and they're not exclusive to Baptist churches uh, and neither are they excluded from Baptist churches they are uh, common amongst us but we see that this is something that is common to all uh, areas uh, you can have uh, a cult of two and that is many times a marriage relationship that's an abusive relationship that's a cult of two we have one who is trying to control the other they use fear obligation guilt public shaming gaslighting all these terms that are common now uh, to deceive manipulate control another person or they may use the same things in a larger setting. It can be a church. It can be a, a, some kind of religious group. It can be a business organization. You know, you, you find uh, cliques uh, within businesses and all where even in prison, you'll find someone who wants to dominate and be in control. And you, you may have several factions. That's where you get factions. That in churches, that's where you get the schisms and cliques is where you divide up into different factions and usually that faction has, each faction has someone that's kind of in control and they are uh, opposing each other. Um, it is a mess. And that's the reason in Proverbs that cast out the scorner 
and the strife will cease. When there's strife, and, and well, and James talks about uh, this wisdom descendeth not from above. But he says where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. And it's based on a certain wisdom mindset and all, and, and it can be made to sound good, but it's not. And how do you know? By the fruit. By the fruit. Is it peaceful? You know, do, do you see peace and, and, and love and cooperation? Or do you have envy and strife going on? That's the fruit. And that's how you can tell. And so, uh, Diotrephes wanted to have the preeminence. He wanted to be in control. Another thing, and it's not mentioned so much in our text there in Proverbs, but a scorner, I think, is described in the New Testament. Uh, as one who has certain feelings of superiority and despises others. And I think that, again, is descriptive. And again, there's a spectrum, perhaps, that we see this. Uh, there are those who may not be the reprobate and the, the scorner, uh, but we see uh, this, this feeling and attitude of superiority where they despise and look down on others that was characteristic of the Pharisees and many of the religious leaders of the Jewish people at the time of Christ, but it is not limited to the Jewish religious leaders. Uh, it is something that is common to uh, our human condition and, and common to mankind. But we see in Luke 18 verse 9, and Jesus spake a particular parable directed at this attitude and those who had this attitude. Uh, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. It was kind of a twofold thing. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. You know, I was thinking about this and the idea of being superior. Now, some things are superior to others. Truth is superior to error. You know, that, that's a given. Uh, morality, a moral lifestyle, is superior to an immoral lifestyle. The difference is in our attitude. Whether, if we have the attitude, I am more moral than you are, therefore I am superior to you. No, it's not that you are superior. There is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That was um, the point that Paul was laboring so uh, hard to get across. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one in and of themselves that is superior to anybody else. Now, if God has revealed to us the truth and right doctrine or teaching on certain things, and of course that is superior And it puts us in a better situation, but it doesn't make us superior to someone else. And, and a part of that has to do with our mindset. Do you feel entitled? You know, when you have a better lifestyle, a more moral lifestyle, a more prosperous lifestyle than someone else, you feel like, well, that was my due. I am a better person. I am, 
you know, and this is my due, and you despise others, that's wrong. When we find ourselves blessed, above others around us, and we may acknowledge that we've made better choices, but why have we made better choices? Because God in His mercy and grace has saved me and has taught me and has brought me through out of those things and we have a, a feeling of gratitude. You know, do you feel entitled or do you feel grateful? You know, for the blessings that you have and the things that, uh, that make a difference. And that's what Paul pointed out. said, who maketh thee to differ one from another? It, you didn't do it. It's what God has done for us. And that difference that God, and, and even amongst believers, the different gifts and things, just because you can speak in tongues doesn't make you superior to another believer that doesn't. Who gave you that gift? And that gift was given to you so that you could edify your brother that doesn't. You see, so it, it's an attitude. Do you feel entitled as a result of it, or do you feel grateful and humbled uh, because of it? Um, when we read that there in Romans one, and he talks, he goes down that list. He talks about God gave them over to a reprobate mind when they closed their eyes to the truth and and to the existence of God and, and God's way in His truth and they just close their minds to it. He says He gives them over to a reprobate mind. And I believe that as He describes those things there, you see no conscience, no remorse, no sense of wrong. That they delight in their wickedness and sin and delight in others that do it. So, the scorner, it's a person that we need to be able to identify and to avoid. That's what the Bible, you know, uh, tells us to avoid. Have no fellowship with them, have no dealings with them, because all they're going to do, they see you as prey. They are a ravening wolf, and they will not spare the flock. And so they are to be identified. They are to be avoided. And we need to avoid those types of pers that personality types because they're everywhere. And it's something that I have become more and more aware of. And feel the need to, you know, teach and warn uh, people concerning this because it is a very real danger. It's a very real problem. It is prevalent. Uh, it is everywhere. As I said, you know, you can have a cult of two, which many times is a marriage situation. Uh, and if people knew and it would identify these traits beforehand um, and avoid them. They would avoid many, many problems later. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult up front to identify them because they are so skillful in their deception. And see, that's Satan. See, he's more subtle than all the beasts of the field. He is subtle. He is smooth. He is deceitful. He's a liar. And he's also a destroyer. And when the scripture says, Ye of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do, he was speaking to uh, those who opposed him. Jesus was speaking to those who opposed him there. Uh, even And I, they were some who had claimed to be his disciples. If you read that in context. And these were disciples. And he said to them, Now if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. This is the same group. 
And he said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son therefore make you free, you're free indeed. And they began to argue with him right then and there. And it deteriorated from that point to where to that same group to whom he had said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. To the same group he said, ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father he will do. He was a liar. He was a murderer. And so we see those characteristics manifested in the lost and particularly uh, even more so in, in those that have a reprobate mind, who have a seared conscience, who are the scorners and the scoffers of this world because they are willingly. Peter describes the scoffers there in, in 2 Peter, the willingly ignorant. They close their minds to the truth. They are willingly deceptive. And... Um, so, uh, it is something for us, as I said, it's a very real problem, a very prevalent problem in all levels of society and, and, and around the world. You'll find the same thing in Russia and communist countries. You'll find the same thing in groups in China or, you know, in South America. This is something that is a part of the human condition and human nature. And you find it everywhere. And I believe in these last days, you see it becoming more and more common and, and more prevalent as the days approach. And Satan is becoming more and more overt rather than covert. And he's becoming more and more out in the open. He is gaining more and more power and control over people and over people's minds. And so we see these things uh, becoming uh, uh, just much more open and prevalent in our society and in our churches. This is not something, you know, as I said, we have this mindset sometimes that we recognize the problem, but that's the problem that other churches have, not our kind of churches. No, uh, our kind of churches are particularly the interest of uh, Satan because it is uh, those churches who are the pillar and the ground of the truth that he wants to destroy. That he wants to scatter the flock. He wants to uh, disrupt and lead astray. Uh, so we need to be that much more on guard. So let us be humbled by God's love and mercy and grace that He's bestowed upon us. Let us manifest uh, that humility in our behavior. And while we will earnestly contend for the faith and for the truths of God's Word, that this is superior to error and superior to the falsehood and the ways of the world, God's morality uh, is superior to the ways of the world and the immorality and sin that we see uh, so prevalent. Nevertheless, we must remain humble and uh, of a contrite spirit and broken spirit ourselves and not be lifted up with pride and become prideful and a sense of superiority and entitlement, uh, but rather remain humble and, and serving the Lord. And may God give us the grace and wisdom, help us to be wise. Proverbs, it's to teach us to be wise. <clears throat> wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. And so, may we seek God's wisdom and understanding and may it keep us from the hurtful and harmful errors that could destroy us and destroy our witness and testimony. Let us then stand together.